Good to see you this morning. Thank you, Matt. Joshua chapter 6 this morning is our text. Joshua chapter 6. I want to thank, uh, thank Mike Bourne for filling in for me last week. Didn't he preach a good message? Amen. It's good stuff, huh? And if you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel. Or even if you didn't miss it, you can watch it again. Very, uh, very uplifting. And I want to continue with the theme uh, that Mike was on last week. That, that is faith. Faith. Last week, Mike talked about the, uh, the Red Sea crossing with Moses. And this week, I want to talk, like I said, about faith, but uh, with Joshua leading the children of Israel into the promised land. If you remember the story, the children of Israel were brought to the promised land under Moses, and um, Joshua, Caleb, and ten others were sent in to spy out the land. And it, they came back with the report, it is exactly what God said it was going to be, a land flowing with milk and honey. It is incredible over there. But the children of Anak, the giants, live over there. And we are but grasshoppers in their sight. Ten of the twelve spies said, there is no way we can take this land. But Joshua and Caleb said, God said we can do it. Let's not delay. Let's go up and do it. But the, the ten swayed the entire population. The rest of the crowd swayed them to walk with a lack of faith and to be afraid. And they chose not to go into the promised land, thereby disobeying God and forfeiting the blessings that God had for them because God judged them in such a way that for the next 40 years, they were going to wander in the wilderness until everybody of that particular generation had died off. We get now to Joshua chapter 6, and 40 years later, we've got a new leader. We've got a younger guy leading. Now, I know that a lot of scholars think that Joshua was probably around um, 69 to 79 years old at this time. But remember, Moses had just died and he was 120. So Josh was the young guy. <laughs> All right? He's the young guy stepping in. And this time they're going about things in a different manner. See, they still had the same problems. They still had the same promises. They still had the same God. But this time their approach was by faith. So I want to read the entire chapter with you this morning as we look beginning in verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. 
So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched ar- on that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, "Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live." She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and let and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Well, let me say this to you, that the promised land is an illustration of believers and the blessings that they have in Jesus Christ. The promised land is not a picture of heaven. That makes for good gospel songs, makes for some good preaching, right? Crossing over Jordan and into into the promised land. But the believer never has to fight in order to get into heaven. They had to fight to get into the promised land and to take it. And it's a picture of, as I said, the believers believers and their uh, blessings in Jesus Christ. It represents the victories of the Christian life with all the battles and the blessings. And you who are here and have been living the Christian life for any length of time understand that. That it's not an easy life. That there are battles. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. There are Jerichos to overcome if we are going to progress in our Christian walk 
to take what God has promised to us. This promised land is a symbol of entering God's rest through the victory that is given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. Never forget that. Never forget that. Today's text demonstrates what can happen when we walk by faith. What can happen when we walk by faith? And I want to start off by saying this, by faith, we can face gigantic obstacles. There's a proverb that says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is too small. Now, my strength and your strength is too small. But we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Right? And so we need to, what? Keep our eyes fixed on Him. Not on our problems. Not on our difficulties. Not on our Jerichos. By the way, God has a wonderful uh, perspective on everything because he's omniscient. He knows all things. So he knows, he knows what your Jericho is. Or Jerichos, because sometimes it's more than one problem, isn't it? It's more than one obstacle. I want to show you a picture here of the tell or the hill of Jericho. This is where Jericho existed, and you can see a lot of digging there. There have been archaeological digs uh, since back, way back, early 1900s and so on, and they've found quite a bit. And what they have found substantiates what we just read. And so we see here about, this is about 12 acres that's what this city, that's the size of this city. And the normal population is believed to have been around uh, 1,200 people. But you'll notice the city was shut up because of Israel. If you remember the story when the spies went to spy out Jericho and they, they met up with Rahab and she hid them, she said, everybody's terrified of you guys. We know what your God did to Egypt, and we know what he, what he can do. And she was ready to worship the God of Israel. Okay? And so because everybody was terrified, not everybody lived within the city, but those who were around the city probably went in, and then they shut them up. So there were... There were easily a couple of thousand people or, or more in this city. Now, before I show you a, another picture, what, what do I have here? Uh, let's go to picture three. Okay, so there, there, there is a rendition of what the city probably looked like on top of an actual picture of the land right now because you didn't have a highway going under the city all right <laughs> that, that we did not have the uh the boston bay bridge tunnel project there in jericho <clears throat> i want to say this I, in mike's sermon last week he mentioned the permit guy <laughs> right the permit guy and oh no Here's a guy who's going to do everything in his power to shut down the church. But God had a different plan, didn't he? And God stopped that. Not by anything Mike did, but it was all God. I remember a time, we've got so many stories, but I remember in East Boston when we were only there a very short period of time, um, there, two times we went to church on a Sunday morning and um, we were in a storefront, and there was a, a, like a stop sign, a pole, through the glass window, uh, or the glass door, and leaning out on the railing. Twice that happened. And so I remember 
saying to the congregation, we probably need to pray about this, do something about that. Well, one of the ladies in the church who had gotten saved pretty recently was the executive secretary for the building owner. And he had done an awful lot already for us. And she said, why don't I talk to him and see if he'll buy a grate for the door? And I said, you know what? Why don't we just wait and see what God's going to do? Let's pray about it and see if God won't supply. And she was like, okay, but I could tell that was a, a novel concept for her. And I'm telling you, within a week, I got a letter in the mail, and somebody had heard about our church, a friend, a relative of a friend, and, and they sent a check. They sent a check for $500, which is exactly how much we needed for a steel grate. God does that. God does that. And we didn't have to live in fear <laughs> again uh, that, that, you know, we were going to have to replace another glass door. So here's picture four. Now I want to give you, this is, this is what they've found. And, of course, some of these are estimates, but two walls, all right? You have a retaining wall at the bottom 12 to 15 feet high. Then on top of that, you have a mud brick wall that goes about 20 to 26 feet high. Then you have that large swath between them. And I forgot the, the approximate footage that they uh, believed that to be. Um, and then the other brick wall, 20 to 26 feet high, but that one is 46 feet above the, bottom, the ground level at the bottom of the retaining wall. So here we have something that is humanly impossible to penetrate. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter the size of your army. You're not getting in there. Even if you climb over that first, that first fence, that, that first wall... There are armed guards with bows and arrows and everything else on the upper wall ready to take you out. And even if you got over it and started up that parapet, you're a sitting duck. Here is, here is something that is absolutely, totally, completely, utterly impossible to penetrate and for them to even think about bringing the walls down. What? No way. No way. Please understand that Jericho stood in the gateway to Canaan. You're not getting in unless you go through Jericho. They're not going to let. They're not going to let a couple of million people just go around. Especially when everybody knows who their God is and what their God did to Egypt. And there were a couple of kings along the way in, during the wilderness wandering, right? Uh, uh, and moving toward the promised land who lost. The news was out. So Jericho was a physical and a psychological obstacle. And I want you to know that whatever problem you're facing today is a physical and or psychological obstacle to claiming the blessings that God has promised you. It is your Jericho or maybe more than one, as I said before. And it seems impassable. I use the word seems impassable. Because you're looking at it right now as, as that first group of Israelites looked at Jericho and said, we can't get by it. There is no way around it. There's no way through it. This thing is stopping us. 
And we have a tendency to allow things that happen in our lives, things that look like they are, this is the end of the story, right? This is the end of the road. This is impassable. But didn't Jesus say that with God, nothing is impassable or impossible, right? Nothing's impossible. All things are possible with God. Remember the promises, Genesis 17, 8, when God said to Abraham, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That's a promise. God hasn't taken that promise back, by the way. And that will be completely fulfilled in the near future, I think, when Jesus returns. Another promise we find in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 7. You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out, so shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. I wrote down last week, I was taking notes while Mike was preaching. Fire Mike. No, (laughs) he's not on staff, so (laughs) I couldn't write that. God can take care of all your pharaohs, right? I know I didn't say it quite right, but that's what he said. And God can take care of all your Jerichos. He said, remember what he did to Pharaoh. Remember what God has done for you in the past. Remember when God stepped in and made you go, wow. Well, why isn't he going to do that now? And why can't he do that now? He can. He always can. The seemingly impassable, the humanly impossible, we can face those gigantic obstacles by faith. This church has faced obstacles in the past, and I have no doubt that there will be obstacles to face in the future. You know why? And I like what Mike said about, you know, children of Israel going to the Red Sea, right where where they camped out. God orchestrated that. Did it take God by surprise that Jericho was right there? Of course not. Do you know what God does? When he intervenes, when he pits us against an insurmountable odd, right? A a circumstance that is impassable and impossible, he makes us rely on him, and then when he does it, he gets the glory. Remember, never forget, biblical Christianity is the glory of God, the good of others, and the growth of the kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about us. That's one of the things that just ruffles my feathers so much about this uh, uh, prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says that God exists for us. And that's a complete distortion. We exist for him. And it's all about his glory. And in the process of bringing God glory, he will bless us. Helen Keller said this, you will find a joy in overcoming obstacles. I I want to say something to moms and dads. Here and watching, you know, wherever you are, watching uh, uh, at, at another time, watching now. For some reason, we're living in a time when parents are doing everything they can to keep their kids from having to struggle. 
when it's in the struggle that we grow. It's, it's by hard times. And especially for believers, it's in the struggle that we grow in our faith. And we see God do things. And, and I think we need to be so, so careful that we try shielding our children and, and by the way, I'm not talking about protecting them. Of, of course we want to protect them. But to shield them from things that are difficult, to shield them from even the consequences of their own decisions and making their own mistakes, right? That doesn't do them any good. And as a matter of fact, it, does, it harms them. And so we need to be careful about that. Helen Keller, you will find a joy in overcoming obstacles. There's such truth in that. Such truth. So by faith, we can face gigantic obstacles, and by faith, we can follow God's orders. Now hear me. The commands of God. There are, there's a whole book in front of us with commands, instructions, that God says, do this and you'll be blessed. Do this and it, and, and it will be good. And they're very specific. There, there are the do's and the don'ts. And I've said this before, I'll continue to say it. When God says don't do something, it's not because he's a killjoy. Not because he doesn't want you to have any fun. I know people who say real freedom is not having anybody tell me what to do. That isn't the case. Real freedom is obeying God and enjoying the abundant life Jesus said he would give. There are people today who are suffering from all sorts of maladies, whether they're physical and psychological or psychological, because they've decided to live life the way they want to live it. And they don't want to have the commands of God restricting them. And we look at society and... All we see is chaos. Chaos. And then people say, well, we, we don't want to go back to those days of you know, the puritanical law, rules and so on and so forth. You know what? Those days seem to be a bit better. No, that's not, the, not that there weren't any problems, not that everybody was, was 100% right and, and holy and godly and so on and so forth. But you know what? People respected people. People could actually converse and disagree. Can you imagine if our founding fathers were trying to uh, uh, found this nation today? Nobody could get a word in edgewise. They'd be shouted down. I mean, there are some, there are some positives here in the Scriptures. We can follow God's orders. Before Joshua moved into the Promised Land and brought Israel in, he met what I believe is a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the commander of the Lord's host. And he was told, this book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate in it day and night, and you will observe to do everything that is written therein, and then you will have good success, and then your way will prosper. I think it's somewhat presumptuous for us to say we can live a Christian life and we can walk the way God wants us to walk, but we're not in the book. 
getting the commands and the instructions and the directions. That's just not going to work. So we, by faith, we can follow God's orders that are specific, uh, his commands that are specific, and the commands that seem strange. Now, was this a battle plan or was this a battle plan? All right, everybody march around once, priests blowing trumpets, and then call it a day. Do that for six days. Can you imagine the Canaanites, the, the folks in Jericho, watching this, scratching their head, going, what is that? They're still afraid. But they're going, what are these guys doing? Six days, once around, blow the, blow the trumpets all the way around, you know. Seventh day, seven times. And then on the seventh time, shout. Now I'm going to tell you what I think. I think that God knew the design of those walls, the blowing of the trumpets, then the shouting of the people created a, a force with the sound that brought the walls down. Now some would say, well, no, God just touched. Okay, that's fine. Well, one way or the other, God did it. Because this is not a plan anybody would have hatched. And there are times when God tells us to do some things, and we go, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like... He tells us to walk by faith, not by sight. And I can follow God's orders when I do that. What are some of those, some of those uh, commands? Well, how about love those who hate me? I don't like that one. Come on. Really? How about bless those who curse me? Mm. Doesn't sound like what I'd like to do. How about give unreservedly? I've got love unconditionally, bless undeservedly, and give unreservedly. All of that, by the way, is in Luke 6. That's just one... <laughs> So that's just one portion of Scripture. How about when Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other one? Well, Lord, is that after I deck them? <laughs> I, I don't know, right? There are all sorts of commands. So, and, and by the way, the one about give, if you look back at the context, it's giving forgiveness. It's giving that unconditional love. It's giving that, um, those, those uh, undeserved blessings and so on. As well as money. And you see, people today, even Christians, they have a hard time with that give. Give, especially when it comes to money. I love the proverb that says, the godly love to give. But some people are always greedy for more. You see, giving is part of God's nature. And remember, what, God, what we're supposed to be doing is exhibiting God. We're made in the image of God, right? And so we're supposed to exhibit God's nature in any way we can, in every way we can. And when we follow God's orders, no matter how specific or how strange they seem. There's always something good that's going to come of it. Always. By faith, we can face gigantic obstacles. By faith, we can follow God's orders. And by faith, we can find glorious opportunities. By the way, I want you to notice something here from the text. Archaeologists have found that these walls, when they fell, they fell outward. They didn't shake apart from an earthquake. Some will try to say that. It wasn't an earthquake. Because they would have found 
the stones on both sides of the wall and all, they fell down. And you know what that did? You remember the picture with the, the, the brick wall, or the uh, uh, mud brick wall on top of the retaining wall? And that retaining wall was 12 to 15 feet high? It created a ramp. Because God said, when you shout, the wall's going to fall and everybody will go straight up, right up in front of them. Straight up into the city. That's exactly what happened. That's what the archaeologists found. And, and, and so, the opportunity that we find is to see God's power demonstrated. To see God's power demonstrated, I absolutely love telling people about what God does. Now next week, Mike Pepper is going to be here, Mike and Diane. We're going to be able to give them the, uh, the Suburban that we bought for them. It's exciting. I, and I love telling the story of how we were able to secure that for them. And I tell everybody, it doesn't matter whether they're Christians or not. I told one of the sales guys at the dealership before we bought it, I said, this, God wants us to have this. Oh yeah, I, I sounded like a sane person to him, right? <laughs> that was before we, we bought it. When it finally went through and I, and I was there and he came out, he said, I guess you called it, didn't you? <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's walk by faith so we, we give God the opportunity to demonstrate his power in our lives. Now, I told you the walls fell outward. I've got another picture. Where's the fifth picture here? Let's see if we can pull it up. All right. Doesn't look like much, does it? But see that thick band of light? Um, that's actually ash. Remember it says they burned the city? That's the burn line that goes all the way around. All the way around. And on top of that, they found in storage rooms pots of barley, full pots of barley, that had been burned. Now think about this. First of all, if you go back and you read when they went, they crossed the Jordan River and went into the Promised Land, it was the time of harvest because the river was overflowing. That was barley season. So the barley harvest had just been brought in. They're afraid of the Israelites, so they've got the city shut up, and they've got all the barley that they can store ready for a siege. The Israelites went in. Now, if you were, if you were a large band of nomads, and you overtook a big city, and it had all that food, don't you think you would take the food? God said, burn it. And that's what they did. And that's what the archaeologists have found. To see God's power demonstrated. It doesn't make a lot of sense to, to go in and burn it. Burn everything. Kill everyone. Kill everyone. Well, God said, well, this is mine, right? The first fruits belong to God, by the way. And then you get the spoils of the rest. I mean, they had the whole rest of the, of the land before them. And so by faith, glorious opportunities to see God's power demonstrated and to see God's pardon delivered. How did this story end? With Rahab, the harlot, being delivered. Now some people say, well, that, if the wall fell down. Now here's what they've found, or, uh, the archaeologists have found. That 
on the back side of the walls were houses. And the poor and, you know, the, 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 the people of the lower rung of society, if you will, they were, they were housed on that first wall. Because, you know, after all, if they, if they were invaded and somebody got over the wall, these people are expendable, I guess. But, you know, that's just the way society was. But if the wall fell down, how could they go to Rahab's house and pull everybody out? Where's the next picture? This is a portion of the northern wall that's still intact. And it's got a house on the back side of it. It's called Rahab's house. So here's Rahab and her family inside the house. The walls fall down, except for hers, except for her house. And Joshua says to the spies, go get her and her family just like you promised them. Now I want to show you something else. If you're not familiar with this, when you read the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, you know whose name shows up? Rahab. Rahab. Because after this, she and her family joined with the Israelites. A good Jewish man marries Rahab, the Canaanite, who ends up being, was she the grandmother of David or the great-grandmother of David? I've, I've forgotten. Boaz, Jesse, David. Okay. She's in the lineage of Jesus. How do you do that? The grace of God. The grace of Almighty God. And I want you to understand that sometimes God allows things into our lives. Things that are not very pleasant. Things that are big obstacles. Things that just don't make sense. And it's not for us. It's for those around us. Because he wants to demonstrate his power and he wants to deliver people. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And what happens is we get so hung up on our problems that we forget God's doing something. And we have to avoid that at all costs, in my opinion. The very first thing we should think when something's going wrong, right? You, you've seen me do this, right? It, everything's going wrong. No, not in God's plan. Everything's going according to God's plan. Right? The very first thing we should do is say, God, show me how you're going to get the glory. Help me to trust you and to walk with you through this, I'm anxious to see what you're going to do. What are you doing? And the prayer should be, don't let me mess it up. <laughs> right? There's a website called creation.com. And they wrote, Jericho is a wonderful spiritual lesson for God's people yet today. There are times when we find ourselves facing enormous walls that are impossible to break down by human strength. If we put our faith in God and follow his commandments, he'll perform great and mighty things and give us the victory. Is there an, a Jericho staring you down? Are there people, circumstances, situations, or even attitudes standing between you and all that God has promised? Identify and face the obstacles. Follow God's commands. And find opportunities. And watch as God brings down the walls, giving you the victory. The Apostle Paul wrote, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. John wrote, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved.
How? By faith. By faith. Have you, by faith, trusted Jesus to be your personal Savior today? I want you to understand, you trying to earn your way to heaven is like anybody trying to pull down the walls of Jericho. It's impossible because all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. They're stained by our sins. And that's why Jesus died. That's why God sent him. He did it for you. He took from you what you deserve so that when you place your faith in the work that he did on the cross, you will have forgiveness and everlasting life. That's the gospel message. I wonder today if you would like to receive Christ into your life by faith, by silently following me in prayer, saying, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I don't deserve heaven. I know that I can't earn heaven. I understand that it's all because of the work of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life right now and be my Savior. I'm trusting you by faith and faith alone. And I'm believing the promises of the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for living for me. In your name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And I wonder today, does anyone here need a faith lift? <laughs> I wonder if somebody here would say, Pastor, pray for me. I have big obstacles taunting me. Pastor, pray for me. I know what God's word tells me to do, but I'm fearful to follow. Pastor, pray for me. I've been so focused on asking God to take away my problems that I've failed to look for the opportunities to get glory for him. Pastor, pray for me. Anybody? Anybody? Amen. Father, I so appreciate our congregation and their honesty. I so appreciate those who've raised their hands. And, and I know, Lord, that some are just saying, yeah, that's, that's me, even though they didn't raise their hand. And Lord, our desire is to walk with you. Our desire is to see victories, but we can't see victories unless there are obstacles, unless there are giants, unless there are Red Seas and Jerichos in front of us. Lord, we don't like those. We shy away from those. We fear those. And oftentimes, we let, them, we let them make us stumble and falter. Help us today to remember this story and so many others about the mighty hand of our almighty God. And we thank you that you love us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Please help everybody here today who raised their hand and even those who didn't, but probably should have. I'm praying for them anyway. With whatever they're going through, give them strength, give them faith, and Lord, give them the victory that you promised in your time and in your way according to your will and get the glory from it all. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.